Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Carolina Weather Group. This is the Wednesday, June the 7th edition, 2017. Thanks for joining us tonight. Tonight we're talking about the uh, solar eclipse that's coming up in August. We have Tony Rice with us. He is an ambassador to NASA, also contributes to WRAO out of Raleigh, and also fellow podcast uh, Weather Brain. So excited to have Tony back on the show. It's been a couple of uh, months since we've had him on, so uh, we'll get to that tonight. Before we do that, a couple of housekeeping items. If you are uh, watching us live tonight, either on Periscope or Facebook Live or or watching us on YouTube or listening to our podcast um, later on in, in the night or, or a couple of days from now, uh, you can follow along with us on Twitter, w -A or Carolina WX Group. Uh, so if you have any questions throughout the show, make sure uh, to send them via our Twitter uh, page or our Facebook page. We'll be monitoring both of those throughout the evening and uh, relay those questions. And we'll let Tony uh, share his social media stuff towards the end of the show. I know as we get close to August, uh, Tony's going to be uh, putting out a lot of information about the uh, upcoming eclipse. It's going to be uh, pretty cool for you guys to follow. So uh, we'll let Tony do that. Besides that, I think that's um, all, of, all of our uh, housekeeping stuff. It's been a relatively uh, quiet weather um, period since our last show last Wednesday. A uh, bit of a cool down here in the Carolinas, and I'm sure where Ricky's at as well. Uh, lower humidity, uh, lower dew points, and it... It feels a little early springish, early fallish outside. Uh, I was just out there before we came on the show, and uh, it's already into the 60s with no humidity, so uh, a little cool for uh, the beginning of June. But uh, needless to say, that uh, heat will be coming back with a vengeance uh, towards the end of the weekend and next week. So speaking of that, let's toss it down to uh, Shay Gibson, who's in Charleston, South Carolina. Shay, I guess out of all of us, you've seen the most weather with some flooding down there over the past couple of days. Yeah, it's been uh, quite a rain event here. Not as bad as South Florida, who received a foot of rain yesterday and maybe even another foot today. We're waiting to see some of the totals there. But, yeah, we've, we definitely have had some, some serious downpours and torrential rains in some parts of the coastline and even inland. So yesterday, I mean, just to give you an example, uh, just from one part of the city to the next, you had 3.5 inches in downtown Charleston, but then right at the airport, inland where you would normally see more rain. Uh, you only had about 0.71, I think it was. Uh, so there's been a lot of variation in the rainfall amounts everywhere, but just goes to show how hit and miss this system is. Uh, we do have the low pressure system that is actually part of remnants of Tropical Storm Beatrice that was in the Pacific and crossed over into the Gulf, uh, or at least the energy of it did. Um, all that moisture training up into the Southeast with the Gulf moisture. Um, I, that's just been real problematic for rains and storms across the area for the last two days. Looks to go on through tomorrow until about tomorrow mid-afternoon, maybe even early afternoon before it clears out. We finally dry out and then uh, we look pretty good for Friday and the weekend until maybe Sunday. So yeah, we've, um, I tell you, but it does feel great outside because the air temperatures are in about the mid-70s today and expect to be low to mid-70s tomorrow. So we're getting a break from the heat. I uh, could even see some upper 50s, low 60s tomorrow night. By the time you wake up Friday morning, you might need a little jacket, which is unheard of in June, but it's not uh, the first time it's happened, uh, at least at least in the last couple of years. It's just, it feels good, but I tell you, lots of rain, Scotty, and even up into the parts of uh, eastern North Carolina as well. So uh, the low pressure system is going to be crossing over into the Atlantic tonight and then riding up the coast and bombing out off of the northeast United States coast. So they're looking for a big rain event up that way as well. Back to you. Yeah, Shay, you were talking about uh, it being cooler and wet down there. You know, we are in June, people starting to vacation to the beaches, so kind of been rainy down there, uh, but this weekend looks good. And speaking of that, people like to get in the ocean, so how's those uh, sea surface temperatures looking before uh, we go uh, over to uh, James? Right, about 80 degrees. So we got up to almost 82 degrees, so we're getting to that optimal temperature for tropical systems. And so uh, the... The same system that's bringing us a northeast wedge today, in fact, it's bringing our tides up because the northeast winds are, are moderate to strong. They, they put a gale warning out offshore, uh, the National Weather Service did. And uh, so, you know, you get these winds, you get these driving rains, and then you get additional flooding, some, some shallow, some nuisance flooding uh, going on along the coastline during high tide tonight. I think we're going to hit about 7.2 feet. Uh, so seven feet is, is considered flooding. We're going to be a little bit over that, about a quarter of a foot over. And... Um, yeah, hopefully we won't see too much, but uh, yeah, I actually went out kiteboarding today for a little bit in the northeast winds, and it, it was um, not the best quality of wind I've ever seen. I wasn't out for very long, 
but there was already beach erosion going on then. So, let's talk tropics for a second, Shay. What do you think about the uh, potential for something forming under that ridge next week? Well, yeah, there's um, you know, a couple sayings: build it high, and they will come low. Uh, I think Levi Cowan had a pretty good one on that uh, ridge over troubled water. So, anytime you get large scale highs above. Uh, tail ends of cold fronts or even tropical sort of built up of moisture down in the Gulf or even Western Caribbean. Uh, they're definitely areas to watch because you get small vort maxes or uh, even tail end of cold fronts, even warm fronts that just sort of linger are all susceptible to getting some sort of low level rotation and uh, uh, surface low pressure in order to get something going. So we'll have to be watching a couple things there. Number one, the Gulf waters are warm enough they should be able to sustain. Number two, the shear over that area. So the, the shear has been a, um, a tropical killer the last, ever since the, the hurricane season began, there hasn't really been anything much to uh, help for development aloft anyways over the tops of these systems. So we'll be watching that. All right. Well, uh, James, I'll let you and Kit kind of tag team how the uh, weather's doing there in the uh, Charlotte metro area. I'll let Kit take the currents if he wants. I will tell you that uh, it has been nice here over the course of the last week or so, as, as you mentioned. Just some of those almost summertime-like afternoon showers or thunder thunderstorms coming rolling on through. Uh, we have a, a big weekend here in Charlotte. The uh, Taste of Charlotte Festival will be happening on South Tryon in Uptown this weekend. There's also a concert at Rom Ramar Beer and Park on Friday night, so lots of reason to get out and cross your fingers that the weather will be good, and I want to take this opportunity to uh, give a shout out, if that's allowed. Uh, my friend Steve is watching from just outside the uh, Philly area tonight, uh, and uh, he's tuning in especially for tonight's show because he will actually be driving down here to the southeast in August to get the best possible view of the eclipse. So I know he is watching tonight and wanted to give him a, a shout out. Uh, Scotty, uh, I say uh, we send it over to Kit, who uh, is dressed to the nines uh, tonight uh, for a little bit more of what's happening in the Charlotte area. Oh, okay. Kit, we can't hear you. But that's a good looking time. <laughs> that's right. This does not spell good for his broadcast career. No, no, we're, we're going to... Uh, you know, Kit, unmute yourself. I, I muted you a little bit ago because we had some feedback coming in. I thought that was you. So try, check your uh, mute on your mic. Uh, I don't know what you're talking about, Ricky. This is perfect practice for the broadcast. This is true. All right, we're going to... We're going to... We're going to fill. We're going to put it to the bottom of the C block, and we'll get back to him later in the show. <laughs> That's right. Let's, let's talk it up to uh, – toss it up to, to Ricky, who's up in Bristol. And, Ricky, I'll also let you uh, bring in our guest tonight. All right. Very cool. Yeah, it's been a, a little cool pattern. I, I did the weather last night in 11, and I, I made the joke that you may actually need a light coat in June with temperatures in the 50s. And, yeah, we're, we're kind of babies, although – Maybe I'm just the giant baby when it comes to 50 degrees in June. Uh, but it was a little cool this morning across our area and just like it has been across much of the mid-Atlantic and Carolinas today. But you know when it's probably not going to be cool is in August. And that's when we have our total solar eclipse, August 21st, ironically right after the Bristol race. So hopefully we get all the rain that weekend there, Scotty. You know, I don't wish it on BMS, but I think if it's going to happen, it's going to be that weekend, right? And maybe we can move it out of there before the uh, race moves in. But we are privileged to have Tony Rice with us tonight to talk a little bit about the solar eclipse and talk a little bit about space and, and turn the tides from weather over to space. So, Tony, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me again. So the, the eclipse coming up in August is, I guess I won't say rare, but not that common in the United States. Talk a little bit about the history of total solar eclipses in the United States. I will, but I'm actually going to totally ruin your toss and totally ruin your setup because somebody said the magic word. Somebody said sheer. So uh -oh. I, I, I got to jump back just a little bit and share a image that uh, NWS Raleigh stuck out there. And I, I promise it has a, uh, a weather and a space uh, right, connection here. So. Oh, that is cool. Did anybody see oh, wow. this? Yeah. Either, if you were staring at uh, radar images, this was uh, earlier today that this came out and the Kelvin yeah. Helmholtz waves. And yeah, I saw that earlier. I wondered if that looked like it from underneath. Do you think that they look, I mean, it's like you, you get a yeah, horizontal view from underneath. A view from above, obviously, and, and those, uh, those Kelvin Helmholtz waves, when you see them in the atmosphere, are, are, are so very cool. You know, look yes. like the, the cartoon-type waves that you expect to see out on the ocean. Uh, but mm -hmm. what caught my eye about it is this is the same kind of phenomenon we see on Jupiter. Really? So there's the, uh, this is a, 
uh, an image that was actually taken by the New Horizons spacecraft on its way to Pluto. Uh, it used, as we often use Jupiter as a gravity assist, it's kind of free energy, if you will. Uh, as it passed by Jupiter, we got some fantastic images, uh, particularly of the little red spot. There's a, a great red spot that you might know about, but there's also a little red spot. Uh, and same kind of, well, physics works the same way on Jupiter as it does on the Earth, especially atmospheric physics. So those same kind of uh, shearing forces uh, can rip those clouds in, in different directions and creates these kind of waves. So I just thought that was pretty cool. That is really neat. And I know Kit's really liking that because we've been wanting you to come on and do a show on Jovian winds at some point. So that's a great time. Yeah, yeah, we'll have to talk about all the different gas giants and, and what's going on there. Uh, you Wait a little bit before you, you get me back, particularly on Jupiter, because the uh, the mission that I want to talk about the most, we'll want the data to come back. And it's a little bit slower coming back right now um, due to some some challenges on the spacecraft. Um, we'll, we'll we'll get those worked out. It's not running quite as fast as um, as we had expected. There's been a, a, a issue with the engine, so it's slowing down the science orbits a little bit. The mission's called Ju uh, Juno. It was actually there at the launch several 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 years ago. Really cool to see that thing go off because it required a pretty powerful rocket. Uh, to, to get that heavy spacecraft moving where it is. So it's in these uh, polar orbits around Jupiter and is uh, going to get a 100% coverage um, with a lot of different kind of uh, imaging equipment there, uh, both in the visible spectrum like this and especially looking at the magnetosphere. I'm trying to turn Not my sure screen share good. off and remember how to do that. It's turned off already. You're good. Okay, cool, cool. As people say, space is cool, right? Space is cool, and, and that's what makes uh, what I do for NASA so very much fun is uh, I, I rarely run into somebody that doesn't have some sort of connection somewhere. They liked it as a kid. They like it now. Uh, it's a real great hook to get people interested in science again, which I think is pretty important right now in our, our, our current society, if you will. Mm -hmm. Very true. All right, so let's talk a little bit about something that's probably going to get a lot of people hooked on science and hooked on space, the, the eclipse coming up in August. So uh, talk a little bit to me about some eclipse history in the United States. Sure. So if we, we think back, um, this is the, the first solar eclipse that has uh, gone coast to coast in a good long time. And I was trying to remember back how long ago it was. I spoke at a Lions Club uh, this afternoon in, in Durham. And uh, I'm pretty sure it goes back to the founding of the Lions Club, which today was their 100th anniversary. I thought that was pretty cool. But as I look back across the map here, the one that I remember, and this is going to date me a little bit, uh, was from 1979. Uh, that was a total eclipse that went kind of swiped up through uh, across the, the border of Oregon and Washington State. I was living down in Southern California at the time. I, I grew up down there. Uh, and up through the um, upper Midwest before exiting out through Canada. Uh, so that was, we didn't see totality, of course. I've actually never seen totality myself, so I'm definitely looking forward to um, August 21st when we'll have the opportunity to see it right in our own backyard, really. Uh, go back a little bit earlier than that, 1970, March, uh, went up through uh, Fayetteville, North Carolina, went up along the, the Carolina coast there, pretty much hugged the entire East Coast before he exited out over Nova Scotia. Uh, going back into the 60s and, and uh, early 70s, there's been a couple of total eclipses that went through the upper part of Canada. Um, you know, going back into the, the, the 80s through 2000, um, 94, there was one that kind of went the opposite direction, if you will, entered through Baja, California, exited out through Maine. That wasn't total, though. That was an annular eclipse. It's worth talking about the difference there, because if you go and look at these maps, uh, you, or if you go on a, a website like timeanddate.com, and we'll talk about some different resources you can go to, to to get the information that you need, the timings, and, and especially some weather forecast. Uh, there's some new resources that were just released yesterday on that that I'm, I'm eager to share. Uh, but if you go and look at these things, you need to understand the difference between uh, the eclipses. Uh, so every total eclipse is going to have a partial eclipse component to it as well. Uh, most of the event is going to be a partial eclipse because the moon is what's physically happening here is the moon is moving in front of the sun and it's casting a shadow on earth. So in order to see that total eclipse, in order to see totality, 
to see the moon completely in front of the sun. You need to be in that shadow. You need to be directly in that shadow. Now, if you remember back to your physics classes, you know that every shadow has two components. It has an umbra and it has a penumbra. So through, and we'll, we'll bring up some of the maps, you know exactly where to go, uh, through uh, extreme western North Carolina and through a, a nice diagonal swath in South Carolina, that's where the umbral path is going to pass. And it starts out all the way out in the west coast, out, uh, out in Oregon, and makes its way across the United States at about 1,500 miles an hour, roughly. Uh, so, Ricky, if you're thinking about flying in the shadow and uh, extending your, uh, uh, your, your reach, unless you can talk one of those SR-71s out, uh, out of one of the aviation museums, I'm, I don't think you're going to be able to pull it off, and I'm pretty sure you're not certified for that. But um, you got to be inside that path. A path is about 70 miles wide. And we'll look at those maps. Just outside of that path, uh, you're going to see nothing but a partial eclipse. Uh, and there's several resources out there will tell you exactly what to expect, when the eclipse is going to start, and what the maximum percentage of the sun that's going to be uh, obscured. So here in Raleigh, we can look for 92%. Uh, in, uh, in, in pretty much most of uh, your viewing area can expect in the, the low to mid 90s. The closer you get to that line that runs up through, you can pretty much draw a line between Cherokee, uh, Greenville, um, Columbus, and um, uh, on out to um, Charleston. You draw a line there. Um, that 70 mile path, you got 100%. As you go out, you get a, a little bit less. So Tony, 90%, you know, or 92% sounds like a lot. Is it in terms of a partial eclipse from a viewing standpoint? Uh, absolutely, and you're, you're definitely going to see something cool. You're definitely going to see something that you're not going to forget, um, assuming the clouds don't get in our way. We can talk about that some too. That's really the, the big risk here. Uh, you're going to get to see some of this, experience some of the same things that you would experience if you traveled to the path of totality. So some things to look out for there. You're going to be outside to experience this. You definitely want to go out and spend a couple of minutes out there. The period of totality, of maximum totality, if you're in the, in the path there, it's going to last about two and a half minutes, roughly. Physically, the longest that that period can last, and the most optimal kind of eclipse, where the moon's just in the right place, is about seven minutes. So we're getting cheated a little bit on this one, but it's in our backyard, so it's all good. Some things to look for when this is happening, though, is all around you. Um, I, I often uh, tell folks when they go to see their first rocket launch down at the Kennedy Space Center, I tell everybody this. Leave your camera at home. Leave your camera behind. Enjoy the moment. I encourage that with the eclipse, too. You're not going to be taking great pictures, so don't worry about that. But if you do have your camera, turn it around and take pictures of the people around you, your family, your friends that are experiencing this with you, it's a really different experience. It's really kind of an alien experience. But also take a moment to take in the environment around you. Notice the temperature. Pretty much guaranteed, even here in Raleigh, we're, we're still going to have ballpark 7 or 8% of the sun showing. Pretty much guaranteed at least a 5 degree temperature drop during that totality. It's probably going to be closer to 10, and it's not uncommon, you know, depending on conditions at the time, winds and things like that, uh, how hot of a day it was leading up to that. Uh, it's not uncommon to get up to a 20-degree temperature drop to the point where even if you're not a weather nerd, you're going to notice it. It's really, really noticeable. These kind of changes are not only going to be noticeable by you know, us humans. If you got a pet, your pet might get a little bit freaked out. It ain't supposed to get dark in the middle of the afternoon, and they've got their own internal clocks. If you've ever had a pet that you, you feed at a certain time, you know exactly what I'm talking about. They, they know when dinner time is. Well, they also know when it, the sun's supposed to be out, so they might get a little bit freaked out about that. Smaller animals uh, especially. You know, domestic pets aside, birds, listen for them. They're going to get really, really quiet. They're going to bed down. They're going to think it's nighttime. Uh, and then when that sun starts coming out again, you know, again, this is based on uh, on what I've read and experts I've talked to about this because I've not actually experienced totality or anything close to it myself firsthand. So I'm really looking forward to this. But they tell me that the birds can go absolutely nuts. 
because it's just strange for them. Uh, it, their their nighttime just lasted two and a half minutes. It's not supposed to be that way. Is there any um, negative side effects for animals? Has there been any research on that and like you know, kind of uh, how they adapt to these kind of things? Yeah, that's a good question. It happens so infrequently. I'd, I'd be surprised if there had been much research on it. Uh, it's just kind of an anecdotal thing that uh, is definitely noticed when when that's going on. Uh, you know, I you know, last saw a, a lot of you guys when I was uh, at the Carolina Weather Fest at um, uh, UNC Charlotte, and after I'd, I'd given my talk on the uh, eclipse, uh, a lady who was, I believe she was a chaperone with one of the school groups that was there, walked up to me afterwards, and, and I apologize, but I forget which African country she was referring to. But as a girl, she recalled being uh, in, in Africa uh, when a total eclipse occurred. And she was sharing some of the, uh, some of the reactions in the town she was in. It was it was not a modern town, let's put it that way. And there was a lot of fear. Uh, there was a lot of, uh, not just from the, the animals, but the peoples themselves, uh, thought the world was coming to an end. So I don't think we're gonna experience much of that in uh, the continental US, but it's it's definitely a very odd thing. I mean, for something you know that hasn't happened in a large majority of the United States in, in many years, it's something that's certainly gonna be a big talking point from people who know what's going on, people who don't have any clue what's going on, they're like, hey, what is this? Why is this happening? Uh, to really generating interest, right? Yeah. And and we may have just had a little bit of an internet hook hiccup, uh, too. Of course, I just that. There you go. We had an internet hiccup, Tony. Oh, we no we lost whatever you were saying there. So, can you shove your camera down just a little bit too, if you don't mind? Um, I put a little. Much better. How's that? That's better. All right. Oh. And uh, so, so, so I was kind of talking about you know how there's going to be a lot of interest around this from people who know what's going on and don't know what's going on. Uh, there is going to be, and it, not just from the folks that are in the path of totality. Uh, it, it's something that we can all enjoy, you know, from the uh, the environmental changes that we're going to see, and the entire continental United States is going to be able to experience this, from San Diego to the, the tip of Maine and in the opposite direction as well. Um, the farther you are away from that path, the, the more of the sun you're going to see, uh, but still, it, it's going to be visible. So, w one of the things that that NASA has put out there is a number of uh, citizen science experiments that are available uh, for people to take take advantage of. Um, being when it is in August, it's going to be a little more difficult to um, for teachers to take advantage of it. But here in Wake County, uh, and I think there's a number of other counties in the Carolinas that have year-round schools, some of these schools are going to be in session. So they're making uh, available uh, experiments, they're making available uh, teacher guides, things like that for, um, for teachers to get their students involved with it. And also science museums. Uh, just about every science museum in the Carolinas is gonna have something to do with this. I was just looking at the, uh, the things that are being offered by the Moorhead Planetarium here in, in Chapel Hill. They're, they're kind of organizing a lot of different uh, events across the state. And as you mentioned, you know, there are a lot of events. I understand there's some NASA sanctioned events that are going on and there's some, some viewing parties. Talk a little bit about some of the, uh, the best spots here in the Carolinas or in our neighboring states that you may want to travel to, uh, but probably want to book your uh, trip and book your hotel soon, I imagine. Uh, and it very well may be too late because uh, hotels started filling up, especially around the points where you get a couple of extra seconds of totality uh, just because of the uh, the, the physics of what's going on and the, the angles there, uh, those have been sold out for years. So I, I think it's probably map time. Let's go ahead and bring those up. One second. So, around oh, here. You can count on Charleston being in there. That's where I'm at. And, uh, yeah, Charleston's in there. It's not ideal. And I'll, I'll switch over to South Carolina in a second. Uh, but I wanted to talk about uh, North Carolina first. So um, a lot of folks are, are looking at the Great Smoky Mountain National Park is a pretty cool place to see this. If you're lucky enough to get up on top of that ridge where you very well may be above some of the weather, 
Um, that's great, but it's called the Smoky Mountains for a reason. Now, most of that burns off by the, the afternoon when this is going to occur. This is early afternoon around 2 o'clock, uh, 1 to 2 o'clock that we're, and I'll show you the exact times in a moment, but when we're talking about, uh, and this is a neat map. This comes from greatamericaneclipses.com. Uh, I wouldn't call it the official site. I'll show you the initial, official NASA site in a moment, uh, but this does a pretty good job. So you see there on the, the center line, 2 minutes and 39 seconds through this part of the world. But as you get out towards the edges here, uh, you only get a minute of totality. Once you get outside of those edges, you don't see any totality. Uh, the North Carolina Emergency Management folks kind of woke up um, about a month ago and went, whoa, um, this is an event that is a once in a lifetime thing for a lot of people. There's already a bit of tourism in this area between Asheville, between the Smoky Mountain parts, uh, here in Cherokee. This is not the most well roaded area, if you will. Uh, the roads there are not going to be super wide. Uh, so they're thinking about having so many tourists, having so many people come into these areas, and what the impact might be to the local communities. It's going to be great for tourism. It's going to be great for you know, bringing some uh, influx of, of money into some of these communities. But, you know, people fall, people get hurt. They got to think about their emergency management. They got to think about traffic management and things like that. So I bring this up, you know, not to scare, but if you're thinking about going somewhere within the uh, the path here, I'd really recommend that you get there the night before. You get there ahead of time. Um, it's tempting to make this a day trip because we're so close to this path. If you make it a day trip, you, you better make it to a, a pretty middle of nowhere kind of place. Um, I'm a, personally speaking a little concerned about I-95. Uh, and, and if we, we scroll down here a little bit, uh, I'm going to be down here in Santee, South Carolina, so, you know, south of Florence, um, north of um, Charleston. And as you can see, the, the path doesn't quite, well, let me go ahead and switch to South Carolina, uh, doesn't quite make it to Myrtle Beach. So it's, it's just north of Charleston. Well, uh, the Charleston's in the, um, in the path, the center line, I should say, is just north of Charleston. Right here along I-95, this is going to be a, a, a prime place for people to see it. Uh, I've already got a, uh, a cabin booked at a state park in Santee. Uh, picked it years ago as I was actually driving back from a launch and noted to myself, hey, the, this is the center line of the eclipse that's coming up in a couple of years. Rented a cabin there. I'm taking my family down there. There's a fishing bridge uh, that was created when they you know, closed off that bridge and built a new one for I-95. So I suspect there's going to be a lot of people on there. What I'm personally worried about on I-95 is people stopping their cars and getting out and looking at this. Uh, probably not the best thing to do on 95. So personally, if it was me, I would get where you need to be that morning at the latest and give yourself a couple hours, hang out wherever you are, and, and try not to be on the roads and try not to be moving if you're going to be anywhere around this, uh, this path of totality because uh, people are going to be distracted. And I base this on some things that I've personally seen in Florida during shuttle launches. You don't want to be on the road around Cape Canaveral during a shuttle launch or any other kind of launch because people will stop and look at the launch in the middle of the road. So uh, I, I fully suspect that's going to happen uh, with, the, uh, uh, with the eclipse. So, you know, just make your plans accordingly. But as you can see, South Carolina's got a, a pretty, good, uh, pretty good show here. Uh, good news is we'll have this show ourselves in North Carolina. It's going to go up through Fayette, but let me see if I can find that slide. I got it on here, or did I remove it? So just by looking at this, uh, just reaching out to the local Charleston and uh, coastal South Carolina uh, viewers, it looks like, uh, according to this map, and I can't see exactly where that two-minute, 34-second line goes through, but I imagine it's up near McClellanville. It'd be well, just south of Georgetown. Well, let's go to uh, a good one. One second. Let me go to the, the horse's mouth, the NASA interactive Google map. NASA Eclipse, and we'll share that. And this is the one to use, especially if you are sharing this on air with your viewers or you really want to make some good plans. Let me find, there's the Google map, and I will share this one out. One moment. Screen share. 
And let's switch to this one. Okay, so here's the Eclipse map. And the magic URL, this is really easy to remember, is eclipse2017.nasa.gov. And this is the magic map. So there's two items that are noted on here immediately, uh, the GE and GD markers. GE is greatest eclipse. Uh, that's the point where the moon is going to be covering the sun the most. And this is of particular interest to scientists who will be studying this um, uh, from a more uh, scientific point of view. This is a rare opportunity to see the sun's corona, to see this atmosphere around the sun. Normally it's blocked by the sun's glare. So there's going to be scientists all along this path that are even replicating some of Einstein's um, experiments that proved his uh, theory of general relativity. Uh, so this is why these things exist. Uh, greatest duration, you see they got an extra five seconds here of totality. But for hardcore eclipse chasers, that means a lot. So they're going to be going, I want to say this is a guy's beat field in the middle of, let's zoom in here. He started having people show up in his, his field years and years ago. Actually, it's in this park now. Um, but this is... Uh, down south of Carbondale, Illinois, I think it is. But let's switch over to South Carolina. Let's switch over to something uh, we all know and love. Okay, so the center line actually runs through a preserve. It runs through the Francis Macon National Forest. I apologize, my mouse is going nuts. But you're absolutely right. The center line is uh, very close to McClannanville. And all of this area through here, I believe, is protected wetlands. So if you're, you're thinking about trying to be the last one standing on dry land in the United States uh, to see the eclipse. Uh, that's going to be kind of tough because you're, this is in the middle of a national wildlife refuge. Uh, maybe there'll be some kayakers out there. I was say a crazy question, but I mean, it is South Carolina. So kayakers and boats may be a popular item. It very well may be. Yeah. I could, um, you know, actually there are a couple of ferries that run out that way. I'm sure they, they may have already booked their, their tours for this event. Yeah, there's now. a lighthouse out there too, if I remember correctly. There is at the tip of Bull Island. That's correct, on the south side of Bulls Bay. Right. So there's a, a very old lighthouse there, and they, the the lighthouse historical commission they um, they do a pretty good job keeping up with them. But they're not active. They're not really um, active nav aids anymore. Okay. But I would say for that area, if you have not booked a trip on a boat or a ferry to go out that way. Might not be a bad idea if they're not full. So. Yeah, and uh, perhaps some of those country roads back there might be able to uh, accommodate a few more people. Um, again, get there early. So here's what my experience is going to look like. And this is what's nice about this tool, is it tells you when the start of the partial eclipse is going to happen, when the left-hand side of the moon first touches the right-hand side of the sun, um, when the total eclipse is going to occur, when the sun is completely moved in front of the, uh, I'm sorry, when the moon is completely moved in front of the sun, that point of maximum eclipse, when it's going to be the darkest, the temperature is going to go down the most, and then as you're backing everything down, so it, it gives you all these timings. When you're using this tool, this this I would recommend this is the most accurate, and I bring that up because I talked about a couple of sites before that give you kind of a good idea of what's going to happen and when it's going to happen. They are not as accurate as this. Uh, all of the, the calculations that are done here are actually done in JavaScript on your browser, uh, but they're using algorithms that were created by a man called Fred Aspernick. He's known as Mr. Eclipse, works up at the Goddard Space Flight Center, and the man is a genius. He, he has uh, forgotten more about eclipses than anyone will know. The guy knows his stuff inside and out, so he created all this stuff. So here I can see that I've got 2 minutes and 35 seconds to enjoy this, Assuming the weather cooperates, and you know that's going to be a, a big if. Yeah, no pressure on us forecasters in the area, that's for sure. Well, well let's say the yeah. skies are <laughs> kind of partly cloudy, though, Tony. I mean, which is pretty likely across much of the southeast on it this is. day. What is our experience going to be compared to, uh, you know, when it's 100% clear? Right. So um, the... Uh, uh, the best way to, to describe this is your, your chances of seeing the eclipse are literally 50-50. Either you're going to be able to or you aren't. And getting much more detail than that, 
you know, I know that's what you guys like to do, but uh, that, that might be a bit foolhardy. All that being said, uh, a good friend of mine who used to work at the National Climate Data Center, and they've changed their name uh, out in Nashville a couple of times, and I, I forget what it is now. He's a former NC State guy. Had an epiphany. Uh, he and I talk astronomy from from time to time, and he had an epiphany and looked at the data that was available to them, and said, "Hey, we got this sky covered data. A lot of it's coming off of of automated equipment at these airports, all over the country. We need to leverage that and uh, come up with some sort of a some guidance on what your chances are of actually being able to see it." So they came up with a fl formula that is predicting the probability of being able to see the eclipse at all. So to your point, you don't have to have a perfectly clear sky to see this. You really only have to have a hole there big enough to see the sun uh, for that period of time, especially that, that two and a half minutes during totality. Uh, hopefully big enough you can see the, uh, even with your naked eye, you'll, you'll be able to see the, uh, the sun's atmosphere. You'll be able to see uh, that glow coming around. Uh, so you really only have to have a hole in the um, in, in the cloud cover for that long. So they created this really nice tool. Uh, it's also interactive. So let's uh, let's pick your favorite weather station here and and dig in and and see what the the data says is going to happen. Real quick uh, for our viewers, what time is this going to occur on the date? Yeah. So here in Raleigh, uh, this starts at one sixteen p.m. It starts a little bit earlier as you go out west, and we're talking a five, 10 minute difference uh, throughout the Carolinas. The period of maximum eclipse here in Raleigh is gonna be 2.44 p.m. This is again on Monday, August 21st, and that's when we hit 93% of the sun being covered. And it'll all be over by 4 p.m. So uh, we're talking just about a three hour period of time when it uh, is making its way across the sun. I was going to ask that. At what speed does the shadow actually travel over the planet? Ballpark 1,500 miles an hour. Wow. So, again, no flying in the shadow, Ricky. <laughs> but I can try. You yeah. can certainly try. <laughs> I've got it centered over Columbia here, or should I uh, drop down more towards Charleston? Let's do that. And we'll see what your, your forecasted chances are. This is a really nice yeah. tool. It's actually probably the best data we have. So let's go North Charleston. One thirteen in the afternoon, probably the probably a, a better chance to see it than after the sea breeze front picks up. <laughs> so. Yeah, I'm I'm kind of hoping the sea breeze is going to help me out that it's going to make it that far inland. Right. Uh, any of those exactly. afternoon clouds that uh, that we always get uh, in, in this part of the world, that right. it'll push them out of the way. But we'll see. So this is uh, saying you the, the the formula that they came up with, which seems pretty reliable to me. Uh, is saying you got a 52.6% chance of being able to see something. Uh, and they break down the instances they see over time of totally clear skies versus a few clouds versus scattered clouds versus broken and overcast. Uh, so to your point, I scattered few and clear, uh, you know, using those uh, aviation report terms. Uh, we should be fine there. Um, broken, you just hope they're broken in the right places. I've watched enough lunar eclipses uh, through broken clouds uh, to know you can still get something out of that experience. Uh, but again, you, you really want it to be clear. You really want to be able to see during that point of totality. So, okay, we're really pulling for a, a robust Bermuda high that day. Sounds Death good to me. Death Ridge across the eastern United States is what we want. So let's talk a little bit about safety, Tony. I mentioned, I remember you mentioning to me at one time that even if you're in that 99.9% .9 zone, you still need to be concerned about eye safety. You absolutely do. And uh, my, my new friends at the, the Durham Lions Club, given their uh, eye health and blindness and, and all, the, uh, all the work that they do with uh, eye safety, we're really, really interested into this. And I, I certainly appreciated that. But yeah, you have to be definitely thinking about eye safety here. So there's some things that you can do. Uh, there's some things that you can purchase. There's some things that you can make. Uh, and if you completely space out on this and forget it's happening, I'll even show you a way that um, you can 
uh, just make a hand gesture and be able to safely see this. So first of all, sunglasses, not good enough. You all right, Scotty? I'm good, yeah. You keep, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> sunglasses aren't going to cut it. You know, even if you've got a drawer full of sunglasses uh, in, the, uh, in, in your desk and you try to stack them up, it's still not going to cut it. You have to be blocking about 99% of that light. Uh, there's a reason why we as humans don't look up and stare at the sun. It, it's going to cause injury, and it can definitely cause blindness. So we need to be careful about that. There is only one point during the eclipse where it is safe to look at the sun, and that's that two-and-a-half-minute period during totality. You can take the glasses off. You can look at the sun. You can enjoy it. That's really the, a rare thing that you're able to enjoy. Even if you're in the path of totality, during that partial phase, during the, uh, the rest of that nearly three-hour window, when the sun is, is showing, you need to have those glasses available. You need to have some sort of an eye protection available. And if you're not in the path of totality, you need to have that eye protection on all the time. So there's a couple different um, options there. And I've, I've already got mine purchased. I just picked mine up online. Um, I forget where I got them. It was probably Amazon or something like that. So uh, let me switch my camera here so what I'm doing. So I've got these right here. These are a little bit fancier. Um, they remind me of my grandparents' cool shades that they used to drive with, uh, but they serve a really good purpose. They've got the nice dark lenses, and they cut out a lot of light. And I went ahead and bought these because and I've got them for my whole family. I bought these this way because I, I wanted to be able to, to experience it uh, the best way possible. But these are going to be usable again in, uh, and I have to look up the exact date, but in, in a couple of years, there's going to be a transit. Uh, all the, the planets between us and the sun periodically get in the way and will pass in front of the sun. Uh, so Mercury and Venus will both do that. And it's actually visible with the naked eye if you've got something that you can use to, um, to shield your eyes with or to protect your eyes with. So these run ballpark $15, $20 uh, and are well worth it. They come in a nice little case, and there's a reason for that. Um, if these should be damaged, they go in the trash. You don't use them. Uh, it, even if there's a little pinhole in here that gets created or a scratch or something like that, that's enough to create a dangerous situation uh, that could damage your eyes. So there are also these nice little cardboard jobs, and these can be purchased online. They, they run a dollar, two dollars, and if you buy them in bulk, um, they will be... Uh, you can get them down to close to 50 cents if you're buying enough of them. So these particular ones you can see are, are, are kind of a little bit janky here. These are going to go in the trash. These are, are demos that I've had um, about a thousand elementary school kids handle. Uh, so I'm not at all surprised that they're a little bit messed up. Uh, but it's using the, uh, the same kind of a, a material. It's a, uh, a film, the same kind of film that's put on a solar telescope to block that light. And this is, this is what you need to, to save your eyesight. So don't bring those 3D glasses from the theater with you. Not going to work. You know, even those, um, those ones that are, are using the polarizing lenses, um, they're not blocking enough light. And if you do get these cardboardy ones, these will work just fine. They're nice and inexpensive. One, I'd recommend you go ahead and get them sooner rather than later uh, because you don't want to be running into shipping problems or them running out, which is a distinct possibility. So I would go ahead and order those now if you could. And when you get them, uh, either leave them in the packaging that they, they came in or get yourself like a business envelope and, and tuck them in there and put them somewhere safe so you don't, um, you, you don't have to worry about them getting scratched. So another way that you can see it, the glasses are, are obviously the, the best because you want to be able to experience this firsthand. But you can have some fun with it as well. You've got three hours to play with here. So have some fun and do a couple other things. So uh, you guys like spaghetti? You like pasta? Everybody likes pasta. Yeah, I love asking love the pasta. elementary school kids. They always, every hand goes up. We all love spaghetti. So somewhere in your kitchen, you've got a colander. You've got something that you use to drain that, that pasta. And it's filled with little holes. Or you've got a grater, a cheese grater, you know, maybe one of those box style graters that's got different size holes. Great things. Bring them outside when the eclipse occurs and have some fun with them. Anything that's got little holes in it is going to act as a projector 
and you're going to be able to see lots of little eclipses projected onto the ground or uh, some type of piece of paper or something like that. And you can do that yourself by taking a piece of cardboard and poking that little hole in there. So what you're doing is reducing the amount of light that comes through and, uh, and doing it that way. Um, another way that you can do this that's uh, uh, you can project it safely uh, so that it can be viewed is uh, take a little hand mirror, uh, you know, maybe something that um, uh, one that comes in a, a little compact or, or something like that and stick it in an envelope and tear yourself a little tiny hole to expose that mirror. You can then use that. That's enough to reduce the, the light that it's, it's pretty safe. You don't want to look directly at the beam, but you can shine that onto a garage door, um, you know, the side of a vehicle, uh, some, some light um, colored uh, area, and you can view the eclipse that way, and you can share that with a lot more people. So there's lots of different things that you can do here. Uh, you can even, if you park yourself under a tree, this is another photograph idea for you. Park yourself under a tree and look at the ground during that partial eclipse. You know, about halfway through is a good time to see it because you can really see the definition. See where that moon is. Uh, look down on the ground, and there's going to be lots of little eclipses that are coming through the branches and the leaves. So lots of different ways and lots of ways for people to get involved. What are some of the um, – you mentioned a few citizen science experiments. Is there anything that you would kind of say, hey, this would be cool to do with your kids during the eclipse? Yeah, let me bring those up one second. A, a real nice list of them. And while you're doing that, I think David Reese joined us, hanging up in uh, Virginia tonight. David? Yeah, what's going on, guys? How's everything? Uh, wet right now. <laughs> Lights a little shower rolling through, but hey, heat's on the way. So That's if true. you're a cold weather fan, enjoy it. All right. Exactly. Probably the last cool spell we'll have for a while. Yup. All right. It's just downloading now. Let me get to the list. So, Tony, for the astronauts on the ISS, will they be able to see anything? We will know. That's an excellent, excellent question, and I hope so. We will know for sure um, about a week before the event. And the reason for that is uh, I've got all the orbital data right now. Uh, I, I send it to Ricky every week, and uh, about 125 of his closest meteorologist friends were, where we identify when the International Space Station is going to be going over. That data is only good for about three days. So I could take that data right now and project it out and, and give you an idea of where the International Space Station will be during that period of time the, um, the eclipse is occurring to even give a clue of whether or not they're going to be able to see it. Um, but it's, it, it's worth about as much as a weather forecast between. It's worth less than a weather forecast between uh, now and then. The reason is that the International Space Station, its orbit changes all of the time. We think of it being up in space, and it is, but there's also a fair amount of atmosphere up there. It thins out kind of gradually as it moves up, so the space station is experiencing atmospheric drag uh, as it orbits, so it is reboosted about once every month or two uh, to overcome that, and that changes its orbit. Not sure when the next reboost is going to occur. We can kind of predict what that atmospheric drag might be. Uh, but as you probably know, the atmosphere is fairly lumpy up there. So it's a little bit unpredictable. So long story short, we'll know about a week ahead of time. Hopefully, we'll be able to photograph it from up there. And it looks like a dark, circular spot on the Earth. It's been photographed from the Mir space station in the past. How about our, our geostationary satellites? Uh, they'll definitely see something. I'm really looking forward to what... Uh, uh, our, our new GOES friend up there, GOES 16, is going to be able to uh, to show us. Yeah, it should, from what I understand, that position still be there uh, when it comes around. We're centered right over the United States, so we should get a pretty nice view across the entire U.S., I think. Yeah, definitely. Hopefully we can get some time lapses of it yeah. going across. Uh, so, citizen science. Um, there, is, there are some opportunities, and I'll tweet these out um, when we finish up here. 
Uh, so the folks that are interested in getting involved in these kind of things, and there's different age levels that are appropriate for these uh, different citizen science projects. But just kind of scanning through them here, uh, there's one called Aurora Saurus that's gathering real-time data about the uh, aurora, that uh, auroral happenings uh, during the eclipse. That's more the mostly for uh, leading up to it um, from some of the northern northern areas. Um, the Solar and Heliophysics Observatory, SOHO. Uh, is going to be organizing images that are taken by that particular spacecraft leading up to the eclipse. So that's something that e even if you're not in the path of totality and you just enjoy messing with some of those kind of uh, images, that's a great opportunity. They got about 20,000, I'm sorry, 27,000 people involved with that so far. Um, my alma mater, Virginia Tech, uh, is working with the in New Jersey Institute of Technology on a ham radio study. They're getting amateur hams uh, to use this as an opportunity to do some more study of the ionosphere and how the sun interacts with that. So this is just a, a couple of them. Um, Globe at night is a, a really good one. It's not directly related to the eclipse, but it gives you an opportunity to go out there and measure uh, the, uh, the amount of light pollution that's in, in your area. So there's a ton of these. I'll, I'll tweet them out later. But really, the kind of the coolest one and the easiest one to do that will work for all ages is just take a outdoor thermometer with you out to the wherever you're seeing the eclipse from and keep an eye on it. You should be able to physically watch the temperature go down. Very cool. All right, I think we have a few viewer questions we want to get to. Uh, oh. Dan Andrews says, uh, I'm thinking of putting a weather balloon up on the morning of the eclipse, working with a hotel and a trying to coordinate with a STEM school as well. Any thoughts on some cool stuff they could perhaps gather from that? Well, I, if you're able to put an electronics package up there, especially something that's you know sending uh, data packets down, um, I assume this won't be a, a tethered one, You know, something that could fly free. Uh, you know, Try to put some thermometers on it. That'd be pretty cool. And if you have any way of, of releasing it uh, in the path uh, of totality, or um, in an area that you know we can predict the wind such that it should take the balloon over the path of totality. Uh, you know, make sure it's taken lots of pictures. If if it goes up high enough and it's got the right angle looking back towards the Earth, that circular um, uh, eclipse shadow, I think, might be visible, and that would be a really really cool um, cool picture to get. That would be and Dan Andrews is also a, a gadget guru, and uh, Dan, if you're if you're watching, check out the uh, Weatherflow uh, weather meter. With that, hooks up Bluetooth to your phone, and you can get all of the parameters for it. You can get your relative humidity, your wet bulb reading, um, pressure, temperature, all of those things. So if you have that gadget from us, uh, definitely check those and uh, check that instrument out for all your readings too. And then share your results. Definitely, that'd be cool to say. Yeah, for sure. Any um. Any possible influences on the weather as a result of the eclipse? I know it's a, such a short time, short distance, but you did mention temperature changes. Anything that could play into? You know, it, it seems like such a mesoscale, microscale kind of thing. I would think maybe not, but... Yeah, I would, I would think so, too. Uh, and, and if you think about it, this is really not that much different. You know, it's more intense uh, than a, a really dense cloud moving over. Yeah blocking that much sunlight, uh, especially in the areas that aren't quite in totality. So I'd be surprised if it, it had much impact there. Okay. Uh, Joey had a question to talk about is Lake Santa La, and I may have said that wrong, near Robbinsville a good spot? All right. got to figure out where that is. Robbinsville, <laughs> north or south Carolina? Well, south, Scotty. You should kind of know where that is, I guess, maybe. Uh, I have no idea where the lake's at, but Robbinsville is in North Carolina. Uh, it's in the southwest corner. All right. I think Rick, Ricky just butchered that name. I'm 100% sure I did. I live in Appalachia, y'all. You know, we don't speak 100%. It is um, near, well, near Yellow Creek. It's basically near the state line of uh, Tennessee and North Carolina. Okay, that might be in the path. Let me, let me get to I'm that. I'm pretty, pretty sure there. of it. It's in the uh, National Forest. Clips. Interactive. 
He also brought up a good point, maybe for those folks who do live in the area. Is there a place that you can maybe find better view in places, maybe like a darker place? Is, is there information on, on how to find the darker places, Tony? Yeah, the darkness is something that you're definitely looking for during something like a meteor shower or something that's occurring at night. really doesn't matter so much here. I think what you're looking for is the, the best chances of a clear sky and you want to have an unobstructed sky. So some of these forest locations might not be the best unless you can find a nice big clearing where you're going to be able to, to see the sun. So uh, planning-wise, um, the, the way that you can know that you've got the right place, uh, you, you've got the data in this, um, in this NASA interactive map. It's going to give you the altitude and the azimuth. So take your, your even your iPhone will be able to do something like this. Uh, and make sure go out to the site ahead of time that you're you're thinking about going to. Figure out which direction you need to be pointing, and then uh, your your phone may or may not be. It'll definitely be able to do the azimuth. Uh, so, for example, it it starts at about 160 degrees azimuth, and then the maximum eclipse for um, most of of this area is going to be about 215 degrees azimuth. And you can see that all on your phone. Altitude is going to be a little bit trickier. It's going to be a ballpark around 60 degrees. That's actually easier when you think about it. The horizon's zero. Directly overhead is zenith or 90 degrees. So just kind of mentally get that sky into three uh, parts. So it's going to be pretty close to overhead. It's only going to be about an hour or so after solar noon. Oh, something else I should point out while I'm thinking about it. The times that are on the NASA site, they're all in UT. So they're all Zulu time. So make sure you do your math. And, so it's five uh, hours Eastern time. Exactly, it's yeah, five, five hours. Five hour difference on the Eastern time. There's also a phone app, really handy phone app that a lot of photographers use. It's called the Photographer's Ephemeris. They'll have that listing on there as well, and you just right. hold it GPS, and it'll tell you exactly where you are on there. And uh, it's a great app. I think it's free for iPhone and a small charge for um, Droids. But I'm not sure. I haven't. I downloaded it a few years ago, and so I don't know if they've changed that or not. Yeah, I use that for planning some neat uh, sunset, sunset yes. shots sometimes. Any more questions? Uh, anything else, guys? I don't see any more, so yeah. Well, while they're I thinking mean. of them, let me share this. So this is kind of fun. Um, there is a minor league baseball club uh, near uh, Columbia that is literally just a couple hundred yards. Their, their home plate of their stadium is just a – a couple hundred yards off of this blue line right here, which is the center of the eclipse. Uh, so it's the Lexington County. It's the Lexington County Blowfish. Actually, I don't think it's minor league. I think it's one of those uh, college clubs. Uh, but they're pretty stoked about this. Uh, they are, are looking at it as, as something that they can celebrate the whole season. And I think their season is just starting up here pretty soon. Uh, but they've had these special uniforms that have been created. They're going to uh, auction them off afterwards to raise some money for the schools there. And they really got involved with the community there and are talking about doing things like um, uh, getting some signs, uh, permanent signs put up throughout the community to say, this is where the center line of the August 21st, 2017 eclipse happened. They're, they're stoked that it's going through their community. I thought this was a, a pretty neat thing. That could just be their mascot now. You know? <laughs> Yeah, I'm actually planning on, on going down there uh, as soon as I can arrange some time, setting up a table and just kind of going through what we've gone through tonight, get people excited about it, uh, get them understanding what to expect, and especially talk about safety. And, Tony, that kind of brings a question to me. How busy have you been? I mean, I know uh, as the ambassador for, for NASA, you, you've probably been pretty busy the past couple of months and probably be busy the next couple of months uh, before yeah. the event takes place. Yeah, it, it's been fun. It's been uh, I've been spending lots of time um, talking with folks about this and getting people excited about it uh, since it is such a rare opportunity, especially talking about those safety issues. One of the neatest things I did was my son's elementary school is you know, just down the road from us here. And I used to go in and, and talk uh, all different space things with them while he was a student there. And I've kept doing it after that. Uh, I was talking with the principal uh, before this school season, uh, school year started. And we're talking about some things that we might talk about. So, yeah, we got to talk about the eclipse. He says, I want you to talk to every student in the school if you've got time. I said, all right, let's get it done. So I talked to about 950 kids 
over a period of a couple of different visits uh, with different assemblies and things like that. So that's kept me very, very busy. Uh, we, we talked about it quite a bit, myself and the other ambassadors. There's about six or eight other ambassadors right here in the area. There's more in South Carolina and North Carolina as well. Uh, but we have a, an event every year called uh, Astronomy Days. Uh, it's usually held at the end of January, early February uh, at the Museum of Natural Sciences in downtown Raleigh. So the eclipse was a very big part of the discussions there. Uh, the slides that I've been kind of poking through here to remind myself of some things, that was from that event. And I also uh, challenged myself a bit and certainly challenged the, uh, the audience there. Uh, went through a 45-minute presentation on Einstein's theory of relativity and how it was proven uh, using an eclipse uh, shortly after he published that, um, that theory. So it's kept me busy, but I, I'm, I'm shutting down come Eclipse Day. I'm not taking any uh, events. I'm, I'm politely refusing any request, and that's going to be a, a day for my family and I. We've been looking forward to it for a while. That's a good time to unplug. One more question from a viewer. This is mm -hmm. actually a good question from Kevin Wagner. He asks, can you use welder's goggles to see the eclipse? Uh, yes, you can. Yes. Yeah, you, you, you definitely can. Um, and there is a specific number, I'll, I'll look it up and, and tweet it out. There's a specific number of that welder goggle that uh, you need to be able to use. There's also a, um, a specific number, and let me pull that up. Uh, there are four companies that have met this standard. Uh, there is an ISO standard that says whether or not um, the uh, that eclipse glass has been, or the even the cardboard ones and things like that, meets the safety standards. Let me pull that up. Um, and again, there's four companies that have met that. It is ISO number. Of course, I can't find it now. One two three one two dash two. Everybody got that? So the e easy thing to remember there is there's four manufacturers. Uh, that do meet this standard, and I will read them out. Let me pull up that email because I just sent this to somebody else earlier today that was asking about whether or not um, their chosen glasses were going to be safe, and it's all about that, that ISO standard. So Rainbow Symphony is one manufacturer. American Paper Optics is another. Thousand Oaks Optical is another, and then there's one called TSE-17. But again, it's that ISO 12312-2 standard that they've got to meet. Uh, it's all about how much light's being blocked. I, I bring this up because there's a lot of glasses that are available online. I would avoid buying any that do not meet that ISO standard. There's going to be some cheap ones that are made overseas that, uh, you know, hey, it's your eyesight. You, you don't want to be playing with it. You want to get the, the right safe ones. Tony, perhaps a silly question, but... For people who are really interested in astronomy, can you use these solar eclipse glasses to kind of just check out the sun on a normal day if you're interested? Absolutely. In yeah, certainly. Like? And uh, it, when the, the sunspots are big enough, uh, you can actually physically see this, the, the sunspots with the naked eye. Cool. All right. Something I may have to try out before the eclipse just to test out and see what my glasses look like. Test them out. Have fun with them. Put them somewhere safe and, and yep. get ready for the big event. Yep. All right. Scotty, we'll give it to you to uh, kind of wrap up everything here. All right, well, Tony, we appreciate you coming on. I'm going to give uh, this opportunity to uh, some of our followers or, or some folks who may be listening later on, uh, on to the show. How uh, can they follow you on uh, social media? So I've got two social media accounts I'll, uh, I'll share with you. One is my personal one. The, uh, we'll call it the manual one that I actually go in and write those tweets myself. Uh, the, that's RTP, H-O-K-I-E, RTP Hokey. Uh, my my current residence in, in Research Triangle Park and uh, my alma mater, Virginia Tech, is where that comes from. And then the other one is Mars WX Report, uh, Mars Weather Report. That one's completely automated. I've got a nice little Perl script running out in the cloud that uh, logs into the planetary data system and looks for the latest reports from the Curiosity rover up on Mars and passes down, uh, not quite real time, but you know, we try to get them up every day or two when the data comes down. Uh, current conditions on Mars. And you really get an appreciation for how chilly it is up there. Uh, okay. Even during the summer months, it's uh, it's quite, quite cold, especially at night. So you yeah, definitely follow those. Those are lots of fun. 
All right, well, Tony, we appreciate you coming on. A wonderful show tonight, and I'm sure we'll be seeing you around. Uh, there's all kinds of things in space that go on that we like to talk about with you, so I'm sure uh, we'll have you back on soon. Next week, next week we're talking with uh, Brad Penovich and Chris Michaels and maybe Tim Marshall. Uh, we're going to be talking about uh, something that's been in the news a lot here lately, in the weather world at least, the differences between tornadoes and straight-line winds, uh, especially down where Tony lives in the eastern part of the state. Uh, there's been several uh, instances with, with some straight line winds and tornadoes. So um, people kind of get confused about the differences. So we're going to have Brad Panovich on, Chief Meteorologist at uh, NBC Charlotte. Chris Michaels, who is up uh, with Ricky at WCYB in, in the Tri-Cities area. And Tim Marshall, um, kind of a, a storm chaser slash um, uh, storm um, damage surveyor. Uh, he kind of uh, lo looks at that. So uh, Tim is actually out in the plane, so it's kind of iffy if he's going to be able to join us. But uh, but we're going to have Brad and Chris at least on with us next week, kind of talking about the uh, differences between tornadoes and straight line wind. And after that, we're going to have on uh, some more uh, tropical stuff with uh, the National Hurricane Center. So we look forward to uh, having you back with us next Wednesday night. Again, make sure you follow uh, Tony on Twitter and uh, keep up with all the latest information about the solar eclipse coming up in August. So for all of us here at the Carolina Weather Group, we hope you have a fantastic week and a great weekend, and we'll see you back next Wednesday night.